Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm, my name is Bill Crossley. Like I just said, I'm the Jurgen Vornis Head of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I get to introduce our recent associate professor, Joe Jewell. I got a bunch of notes, so I don't miss anything. Uh, Joe got his BS from Caltech in 2004. Went back to his home state, got an MS at the University of Michigan in 2005, then won a Rhodes Scholarship. Went over to the UK and got a MS from the University of Oxford. That was 2008. Came back to the States, did his PhD at Caltech, and graduated in 2014 with his PhD. After graduating, he spent five years at the Air Force Research Labs over in Dayton, Ohio. And then he joined us in 2019 as an assistant professor. Uh, Joe works in experimental hypersonic aerothermodynamics. He's really working on measurements that we take of the boundary layer transition from laminar, which is smooth, to turbulent, which is, has a lot of turbulence and, and lots of I don't know, friction, I guess is the right way to say it in a layman sense on bodies that are going at four, five, six times the speed of sound. It's really important for heating. It's really important for control of those vehicles. And so Joe's at the leading edge of taking a lot of these measurements. Researchers worldwide use the measurements Joe and his students take in our Mach 6 tunnel. They use those to validate and compare their computational models. And it's people all around the world doing this. One of the things he's also done is he's put some high quality optical measurement techniques in the tunnel that didn't exist before Joe got here to Purdue. And that's enabled some new measurement techniques. And he's probably got a picture of them running up there already, so that's great. Um, that type of discovery has led to a lot of external support and recognition, including a 2000, 2021 ONR Young Investigator Program that Joe won. And then in 2023, back to why my title is Jurgen Vornis, we worked with Bill Jurg to get some recognition for our junior faculty, rising stars essentially. And so in 2023, Joe was recognized as John Bogdanov, Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So with that, please welcome Joe Jewell, Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. And so I've got kind of, I'm, I'm bookending my, my research career. I think that was my freshman year there with uh, my uh, paternal grandparents, Grandpa and Grandma Jewel, and then with my first graduate student uh, in the middle, Dr. Liz Benitez. More about her later. Uh, Purdue loves that photo, although it's completely posed. There is no actual education taking place in that shot. <laughs> it's not even her wind tunnel model, but you know, we both look good and it's, it's just very, yeah. Anyway, all through the pandemic, they shared that, so I felt I had to. So I, I put kind of the personal touch on mine too. I hope that's okay. Um, in the beginning, I, I, I was born in 1981 and I lived all of my life in uh, Stevensville, Michigan, which I thought about putting a map here, but as any true Michigander will do, I'm gonna show you on the hand. So Stevensville is actually right here, whereas we are roughly down on the wrist. So it's about a two hour drive, um, you know, cause it takes a dog leg. Uh, so I'm not actually too far from my hometown, but it was a long journey. Uh, to get here. And I've just put some of my family members here. So this is a photo. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, now that I've got tenure, I can say that I am actually a University of Michigan fan. Um, Purdue is great too, but um, you know, I, I sit in my uh, grandfather's seats at the big house, so it's, that's a, a family thing. So I've got my, my um, nuclear family there. So that's me and then my dad, who uh, passed away in 2021. My little sister, Elizabeth, who actually lives in Ann Arbor, and then my mom, Susie, in the ridiculous puffy uh, hat at the end there, sitting in, in Michigan Stadium. And I was also very close to my grandparents. I grew up within uh, just four miles of all four of my grandparents. Um, so there's again, Grandpa, Grandma Jewel, uh, in front of, uh, I think, my freshman year uh, science project. Uh, and then Grandpa, Grandma Kramer, my, my mom's parents. Uh, Richard Kramer was really just a profound um, influence on my life, so I, I couldn't include a talk without uh, highlighting him specially. He was an engineer, and he actually had a great deal of creativity. So this is him in age 91, uh, actually the year he, he died in 2011, and he, he had gotten into computers, which was, you know, not now of course all older people use computers, but back then that was a little more unusual, and had built this, uh, you know, table, and he was very proud of his woodworking skills and that he could build a table to accommodate his, his um, his mouse, and so not uncoincidentally, my oldest son is named Richard, and one of the uh, joys that I've gotten to experience is that he did get to know um, Richard, the original Richard's uh, wife, my grandma, Dot, um, before she passed away. So that's the two of them in the middle, and then that's me with uh, grandpa at about the same age. Uh, so kind of fast forwarding to high school, we'll skip over the very undistinguished athletic career I had. I spent a lot of time doing science fairs and science Olympiad. I'm building a Rube Goldberg device there. Um, I did kind of some of the nerdy quiz program things, and I spent a lot of time on music, actually. So that's me on the far right here at the state marching band finals in 1999 in Michigan. I played at an orchestra, and then um, 
I, I also was a uh, presidential scholar, which means I was the top male high school graduate for what that's worth uh, in Michigan in the year 2000. Um, so I got to go to the White House and I met uh, Bill Clinton. It was kind of a surreal experience. I, I later found that uh, the presidential scholar for the year, I think 1964 or something like that, the male from the state of Indiana, was a person named Mitch Daniels, who later went on to a reasonably distinguished career as well. Um, I went to college at Caltech in Pasadena, California. Caltech is a very, probably all the engineers in the room know, uh, but it's, it's a very small school. So it's 900 undergraduates and 1,200 uh, uh, grad students. So to put that in context, the total number of students is not so dissimilar from what we have in the School of Aero and Astro here at Purdue, but that's the whole college, grad school and undergrad. Of course, they have uh, 300 professors, not 50, but that's a, a different story. Um, so I, I chose it basically because I wanted, I, I liked it that it was smaller and I wanted to leave the Midwest, to be, to be frank, uh, which are maybe silly reasons, but it, it worked out um, well for me. I got to do a lot of cool things. Maybe the, the most cool was uh, flying uh, three separate times on the KC-135 uh, Vomit Comet and experiencing microgravity for if you add it all together, it's like nearly half an hour now. Um, and so our, our uh, advisor for this project, for one of the projects, put, it in touch, put us in touch with one of his alumni who was an astronaut. So Purdue is not the only university with astronaut alumni, uh, Dr. Garrett Reisman, uh, who gave us really kind of an awesome inside tour of all the most important uh, space shuttle simulators from the cockpit to, yes, the toilet. They really do have a simulator. I, I show that in all my um, classes. And so the two questions I get, I'll just answer in advance. Yes, they really do. And no, of course, I did not. Uh, so I graduated with degrees in aeronautics and medieval history. I wanted something to do besides uh, science with my time, and there was no music major. That would have been the obvious choice for me. MIT nearly got me because they have a music major. But um, yeah, so, so that was fun. I also got my first scientific publication in 2002 and tried out lots of different lab groups, uh, which is easy there because they have so many professors, to figure out what I liked and what I didn't, which was an advantage going forward. Uh, so I did spend a year in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan to kind of legitimize my uh, fandom with a degree, which is good. Um, but honestly, the year went fast because only a few months into it, I, I interviewed for, actually the second time, I didn't get it the year before, uh, the Rhodes Scholarship and won that in November 2004, which was really a turning point in my life in many ways. Um, and so Oxford was a good academic experience, but even more importantly, it was for me the college experience that a place like Caltech was never going to be, I think. Um, so I did a second master's degree there. Uh, and spent lots of time with uh, rowing orchestra, travels, lab work, and I met many very interesting people. If we have time to get to that, I'll, I'll go through those in the backup slides, but suffice it to say they keep me humble. Uh, so grad school part three or Caltech part two. Um, after the time at Oxford, I knew I wanted a research career. I also knew that the United States was the right place to do, at least at that time, I thought, um, <clears throat> an engineering PhD, particularly in hypersonics. So I went back to Caltech. Um, I worked in a reflected shock tunnel called T5, which is a high enthalpy facility. Uh, and it's not dissimilar in many ways from the high pulse facility that I've been working since 2020 to get stood up at Purdue. So this is kind of serendipitous experience since never did I expect that Purdue would have a reflected shock tunnel drop in our laps uh, just a year after I arrived, and yet it did. Uh, so I finished my PhD in 2014 and did a history minor there. And also, uh, even more importantly, I married Katie in 2012. Katie, my wife, is, is here today. So that was probably the most important part of that experience. I then spent about five and a half years at Wright-Patterson Air Force Laboratory in Ohio. I started there on a, a postdoc program called the NRC Research Associateship. Um, and I intended to just stay for two years and move to academia. But I liked it more and more. And as I told my um, advisor there, Roger Kimmel, well, you know, when I, when I arrived, I said I was just going to stay for two years and, and leave for an academic job. But every year I'm here, after the first two, I moved into kind of a permanent type position. Every year I'm here, uh, the quality of academic job it would take to get me away from AFRL goes up a little bit. Until by the sixth year I was there, uh, it, the universe was really quite restrained, but it did include Purdue. And so Purdue recruited me away in, in 2019. I got a call kind of out of the blue from Steve Schneider saying they were looking for someone to replace him essentially, which I had not expected to happen for several years, but was an excellent opportunity that I couldn't say no to essentially. Um, and so they wanted me to run a low enthalpy Mach 6 wind tunnel, so not hot flow like 
I had done in grad school, but a lot like the Mach 6 wind tunnel you see me which, with there, uh, it's a Ludwig tube, I won't get into the technical parts until later, um, and so it did make a lot of sense for me in, in that respect too. I still maintain very close ties to AFRL and my first PhD graduate who you saw on uh, the, front, uh, the front slide, Dr. Liz Benitez, after she graduated, uh, went into roughly my, my old role. Um, I, I recommend having a very productive PhD student as your first, by the way. Liz actually produced her PhD thesis and a baby in the same year, which now all the others um, in, I have, that's something to live up to, you know. Uh, half of them can't even hope to match that. Uh, so then Purdue, uh, this of course is how Purdue really got me and how I knew that Purdue actually wanted me was I, when, when I interviewed, they asked is, okay, is there anything else you want to see while you're in West Lafayette? And I said, well, you have the world's largest bass drum, I think, right? Um, and so, lo and behold, Steve Schneider actually put on my itinerary, you know, world's largest bass drum, and he took this photo. And if you know Steve Schneider, you know, for him to spend any time whatsoever on something like this is really, really exceptional. So I got to play it, it was, it was uh, really cool. Uh, and since then, I've done teaching. Um, I'm known for my uh, quote-unquote dad jokes. I don't know what they mean by that. I think they're just jokes um, and, and advising. So there's uh, my first PhD graduate in the midst of the pandemic, uh, Liz Benitez, and also our third son. I should have mentioned the first two on the last slide. I think they were there in the text, Richard and Theodore. Our third son, our pandemic baby, Elliot, was born here in West Lafayette. So now onto the technical part of the presentation, which is maybe even shorter than the personal part, I guess, but uh, why study hypersonic flow? Um, so I, I just have, I have a couple of vintage uh, illustration here in the lower left of the National Aerospace Plane, also known as the X-30, uh, which was a, a plane designed in the, uh, the late, the mid to late 80s, uh, and which was supposed to revolutionize travel uh, and you know, get us from point to point across the, the Pacific Ocean in 45 minutes and all sorts of things like that. Uh, it, it eventually didn't close. Uh, and so there's this quote from Aviation Week in kind of the post-mortem after, after the project had been canceled in 1993, that uh, the uh, insufficient technical progress had been made and the Defense Science Board found that uh, boundary layer transition was the specific factor uh, that couldn't be determined with sufficient accuracy. So essentially, without getting too much into the technical details, if you assume that the, fl the flow is laminar over this vehicle versus turbulent, the uh, weight uh, varies by a factor of two, which is a lot in aerospace. Uh, so insufficient modeling there was, was a big factor. Um, and then there are some more modern examples here, the Falcon HTV-2, which uh, had some aerodynamics issues and loss of control. And then, um, of course, hypersonics done right. Uh, the, the one, I think one of the most amazing photos in aerospace, so I included in many of my talks, uh, even though I had nothing to do with it really. Uh, we did a little bit of testing in the heat shield in T5, but uh, we, it's, which is uh, Curiosity arriving at Mars and photographed under its parachute by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. orbiter. Uh, but mass is at a premium to Mars. I think we've heard it's something like $10,000 to put a pound of mass into orbit. It's about a million dollars to get a pound to Mars. Uh, and the heat shield on this had, you know, two-thirds of its life essentially left, I believe is the figure, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, after it entered the Martian atmosphere. So it was designed with huge margin, which is good in a sense because you want to be sure it survives, but uh, that's a lot of kind of useless mass that you're sending all the way to Mars at a million bucks a pound. So to what I do here at Purdue, I, I run uh, the Boeing AFOSR Mach 6 quiet tunnel, known as BAM 6QT. I can take no credit whatsoever for the design and construction of this tunnel. That was all Steve Schneider over uh, the past 30 years. Uh, and there are some key features of the tunnel, namely the elongated um, nozzle shape, most importantly the mirror finish on the inside of the nozzle, uh, bleed slots that get rid of the turbulent boundary layer inside the nozzle, and then a burst diaphragm mechanism that's downstream. Uh, that enables us to have free stream noise levels, so acoustic disturbances of as low, as much as 100 times less than atmospheric, or 100 times less than conventional wind tunnels and more like atmospheric flight. So this illustration here just shows essentially how we do it. This is a cone progressing through um, a, a, a range uh, at uh, Mach actually 4.3, I think, so not quite hypersonic, but similar principles. And so on the top, you can see the laminar regions in the boundary layer. On the bottom, you see completely turbulent boundary layer. These striations here are the acoustic noise. And so by holding the boundary layer on the inside of our wind tunnel nozzle, laminar like this, uh, we are able to reduce the acoustic noise by a factor of 100. And we're the only active wind tunnel in the United States that can do this. As Bill mentioned, um, my big kind of uh, push has been to 
put optical methods on the tunnel. And so now due to that downstream burst diaphragm mechanism, the whole test section has to be designed to accommodate um, the full stagnation pressure of the tunnel. So a typical wind tunnel might be built to take two atmospheres. We have to take 20 atmospheres plus a factor of safety. And so putting windows on the tunnel is no joke. Uh, but that, is, that was my project. Uh, the first kind of order of business one when I arrived at Purdue was to get real windows for the tunnel. Uh, so we designed and built uh, inch and three quarter thick sapphire crystal windows, very expensive and with a great deal of design that went into them. Um, but now we can do uh, revolutionary techniques tongue-in-cheek like Schlaren. So there had never been Schlaren in 25 years of history of this tunnel, but now we can do it. And so we can see what you see running on repeat here. You can see the difference between noisy flow and quiet flow. So the first part of that video is noisy flow. That's not the tunnel startup. That's just post-startup, but conventional noise free stream, what would count as steady flow in any other wind tunnel at Earth. So lots of people can do this. Only we at Purdue can do this. And so that doesn't matter necessarily for every hypersonic problem, but for a great deal uh, of problems that involve instability or unsteady flows, it may well measure. Um, we've also been able to take uh, some really beautiful pictures in our quiet free stream. So this is just a kind of a small gradations in Reynolds number on a, a long cone designed to maximize Reynolds number taken by my student, uh, Samantha Miller. Um, and you can see as you increase the Reynolds number slightly, you go from um, modal disturbances to nonlinearity in the second one to the nonlinearity at 11.4 million per meter uh, coming in at the left. Uh, to breakdown happening almost immediately at 12 million, and then at 13 million you have a fully turbulent boundary layer. So these, these videos are taken at nearly a million frames per second uh, and are the first of their kind uh, in, of natural transition. All right, so this is another example. So this is a typical, so the model is there in the upper left. This is a cone with a slice and a ramp designed to be a canonical publishable example of uh, like a deflecting control surface into flow. And so this is a, a flow that, that uh, you know, is considered highly unstable based on a lot of data taken like at the bottom. So at the bottom here, that's a conventional noise uh, version of the flow. You see the top two, the top is a low Reynolds number, low disturbance flow. The middle one is uh, nearly the same Reynolds number as this conventional noise tunnel. And yet you see the noise, the, uh, the motion of the flow is completely different. And so this is one good example of actually it's not always a benefit to have quiet flow. Uh, in, in, in like in the atmosphere, because if you have a shock boundary layer interaction, like we're seeing about where that arrow is pointing, where the reattachment happens, that creates a hot spot. And so if you have um, a flow like in the atmosphere where you don't have disturbances moving it around, that hot spot is like holding the hairdryer on one spot on your head. It gets very hot indeed. Whereas if you move it around in noisy flow, uh, then it moves around and the max um, heating is actually potentially reduced. Uh, another good example, so this, this is a model here in the lower left, you can see just barely here a different color, so this is actually micro drilled holes. This is a cold flow tunnel, so we can't actually do ablation, but we are working on gas injection, diffuse gas injection to represent um, the outgassing that comes with ablation as part of an ONR funded project. I should have put my student Chris Chinsky's name on this, this is his work um, primarily. And so we do actually have, uh, this is a playing movie as you can see. So the difference, and this is the same Reynolds number, the same mass flow rate. I have the injector location highlighted here. You can see kind of the bubble here and the bubble here from the gas, and it feeds forward a little bit into that uh, region, the low speed region of the boundary layer. Uh, but this is a flow that everyone would have said is inherently unsteady based on noisy flow data. And indeed, when we run in noisy flow, it, it does look very unsteady. When we run in quiet flow, however, it looks quite steady. So as a metric of that, uh, we have a shock tracing algorithm here that uh, traces out the intersection of where this, this shock line intersects with the uh, cone. And so the noisy flow there you see in red and the quiet flow in blue is vastly different. So this is a problem that cannot be, cannot be simulated correctly in a conventional wind tunnel. Uh, recently, we've increased the performance. This is the other big thing that's happened since I took over. Uh, we've increased the performance by 40% uh, by uh, getting an especially fine polish on our throat, which has enabled us to take some uh, data like you see below. So we can get to, this is the bolt geometry. If you follow a hypersonic flight test, you may, you may know it, you may not. Um, but we were only able to get uh, instability streaks here, as you see in the middle. Now we can get all the way to transition. So of course, if you run the tunnel noisy, you can get to transition, but you get these big broad wedges that don't actually reflect what happened in the flight. And this actually happens to have been a good match with the flight data. All right, just a couple of slides about the future here before questions. This is the hypersonics and applied research facility uh, where we are now putting a reflected shock tunnel. 
Uh, I don't have any photos of it in situ because we're still working out the photo policy, but this is the outside of the building. Um, and so this is the building in its old home, which was at Northrop Grumman, uh, Ronkonkoma, the old Gassel facility. Purdue agreed to take this uh, in 2020, so quite a time to start any new project. It was actually moved in summer 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, uh, where it waited a couple of years for the building to be constructed. And now that we have the building constructed, we have assembled it, and uh, we will be able to, uh, by this summer, so we're gonna actually burst the first burst diaphragms within a week, which is very exciting, but so that's kind of a demonstration type, um, you know, shakedown condition. We intend to be doing hypersonic testing in earnest in that Mach 4 to Mach 25 plus range by this summer. Uh, and so to explain just a little bit about how a reflected shock tunnel works, I built this toy uh, simulation showing um, how uh, the shock reflects down the shock tube. And so that reflected shock multiplicatively uh, adds temperature and pressure to the gas. And then you expand it through a nozzle um, here. And I've got little people for scale. This is actually the Caltech T5 tunnel. I don't have one built yet for high pulse, but it, it operates in much the same way. This is a little dry, so I actually do have a, a uh, a video here. So this is this is where you st actually stand to operate the tunnel. This is where you'd like to stand uh, to get the best view. So we put a camera there, not a person. Um, but so this is during a test. Oh, there is noise. Sorry. All right. So that was the test. And then you can see the self-luminosity of the gas as it comes through. So the actual test time is between one and 10 milliseconds. So I highlighted it there. It's actually much less than one frame at 32 frames per second. But so that's the test. Uh, so soon we will be able to, uh, this is not a, a low temperature flow. This is a very high temperature flow. So soon we will be able to create these flows at Purdue as well. So final slide, thank you. Um, to the students, I, I hope I did not leave any students off there. I've had about um, 30 now students and alumni, which I'm very thankful for. Mentors, which is another large category, and then colleagues. I, I particularly want to, I, I realized after um, I made this, that I left Sally Bain's name off that. She should be there, so I will, I will verbally mention her. And then a much less organized uh, set of sponsors than uh, the last presenter. So, but anyway, thank you to all the sponsors as well. Um, and then, of course, the most profound thanks to my family. Um, so my mother and sister are very close uh, to us, especially since my father uh, passed. And so that's, that's all of us together on the left. And then on the right is a somewhat more recent photograph of, of me, my lovely wife, Katie, and our kids, Richard, Theodore, and Elliot. So without their support, um, I couldn't do any of this. All right. Thanks, Joe. And again, congratulations on the promotion and on the name professorship. Thank so you. I'm supposed to facilitate Q&A for Joe. So do people have questions for Joe? This is Dean Arvin Ramon. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You know, I don't get too many chances to get geeky. So this is great. I love, I love these presentations. There's a couple of quick questions. Uh, <clears throat> First, uh, <clears throat> about that, that uh, the Mach 6 wind tunnel, when you're looking at the transition, um, like, are you, I mean, the instability mechanism, is that TS, Tolman Schlichting? No, no, it's not. It's uh, Tolman Schlichting drops out uh, of importance past a, a certain sort of kind of Mach 3, Mach 4 type level. So it is typically what's called the second mode, uh, which is in some people have, say it's somewhat like a two-dimensional version of Tolman Schlichting, it's actually somewhat different, right. but it tends to be, that tends to be dominant. Um, Are you able to, visual, do you have enough uh, <clears throat> control on the Reynolds number to actually see, like visualize this, the, that secondary wave? Oh yes, it's, yeah, that's those, those animations that, that's I showed the, you, that okay, is, that's the, those, is, that very Got regular rope-like wave. Yep. Because it's a 2D wave, yep. it actually is very amenable to Schlaren, yep. even though Schlaren integrates. Um, so Good. yeah, so those are <laughs> pictures of it, and then, as it breaks down, those were the slightly higher. So we get really good Reynolds number control. In fact, because the way the tunnel runs, it runs in two millisecond chunks of quasi-steady flow. Yeah. So actually, each test is about a 25% sweep in Reynolds number. And, and is your test section, second question, is your test section circular or square? Circular. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, you know the original uh, <clears throat> Schlieren images were for an axisymmetric elongated cone. Uh, right. <coughs> when you do the bolt, which I understand is non-axisymmetric, uh, that wasn't sh what we saw in sh bolt was not Schlieren. That was uh, direct IR heat transfer. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so we put on a different kind of window. Actually, we use silicon, so you can't see through it with your eyes, but it's quite transparent <laughs> in the infrared. And then we take pictures of the direct temperature measurements of the surface. But, but I guess my question is, <coughs> when you compare with the original Johns Hopkins bolt testing, the test section diameter was it like if it's if it's non axisymmetric do we have enough of 
a di- wide enough you know diameter section here that allows oh, us to. Oh, I see to- what you're asking. I mean, we, it was a subscale bolt, of course. So okay. We, we, okay. we ran a Got we it. ran a thirty uh, percent scale bolt. Got it. But the, as as I explained, in the, and you're welcome to come. As I explained in uh, yeah. my my wit, my three thirty three class, the heart of wind tunnel testing is that essentially that you can change the density to adjust the Reynolds number. Yep. So Reynolds number is the figure. You, if you match Reynolds number and Mach number, you're you're good. Which can be hard if you don't have a pressurized <clears throat> tunnel. But our tunnel is pressurized, so we are running effectively at a higher density than the atmospheric condition would be, but we make the Reynolds number match. I had not realized that. Yeah, Something that, you learn every day. This is great. That's, that's Thank how you. wind tunnels are yeah, relevant. So otherwise, you'd, you could only run a wind tunnel if you had a full-scale plane. You know, which, yeah. <laughs> hey Joe, I'm Nicole Key. Nice to yes. meet you in person. Um, so I just learned that we can use the Purdue drum as a recruiting tool, Eckerd. <laughs> only for, only for former percussionists, maybe. So it might be a special. <clears throat> I might be a special case. Yeah. So this is a great presentation. Um, I'm excited to see what's in that building that I can't see at Zucro, right? But um, so your window. I have a very simple question for you. Mm-hmm. Your window. There must be seams, right, where your window is inserted in your test section. Um, well, do you mean cavities? So yeah, it creates a cavity, essentially. Well, or just like the flow is going to see a lip, like as it transitions right. from your polished surface to the window frame to the glass. And actually, the, the nozzle itself is five sections. So we, the nozzle itself, the first, and as the boundary layer gets thicker as it goes down the nozzle, essentially, the degree of care you have to take goes down because it's less amenable to being affected by those steps. So the first couple of, couple of uh, set, uh, pieces of the, the nozzle we actually send off to our polisher, uh, and he bolts them together and then polishes them once they're bolted. The next segment, you, you were careful, but you have to take somewhat less care. By the time you get to the windows, the boundary layer on the nozzle uh, is a couple of centimeters thick, or more than a centimeter thick. So the kind of seam that we're able to achieve, even just by good machining, to say nothing of polishing, is uh, enough that it doesn't disturb the, the flow. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's that's a good. You couldn't do it further upstream, though. Right. That wouldn't work because that's the boundary would be too thin. Yes, sir. Uh, so you alluded to pushing up to uh, Mach twenty five uh, capacity. Uh, like what? In are a the different a- facility, though. A different yeah. facility. Um, are there any applications for that other than like atmospheric reentry or? Like- well, orbital velocity is is about Mach twenty five if you convert it to Mach number, um, so and then so that's for Earth orbit velocity. So there are actually. Uh, what's known as superorbital velocities, so we can actually get higher than Mach 25, and that would let us simulate, for example, uh, lunar return missions or Martian return missions, uh, potentially missions that are not re-entry but simply entry to outer planets or outer moons might go that fast as well. But yeah, typically it's an entry or re-entry. That that is typically what happens. You could there is also naturally occurring hypersonics like uh, meteors might go that fast, which is kind of cool. The questions for Joe. Do you want to mention real quick the work you're doing with the snowflakes? Because I find that intriguing. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And I should have mentioned uh, Hallie Chelmo uh, on that also. But I, it's, well, it's a good thing I went past that slide fast. There were lots of, lots of names that should have been acknowledged there. But um, yeah, so I'm doing a work, work with uh, it's ONR-funded work uh, with the University of North Dakota, where they know a thing or two about ice up there. Yeah. Uh, and so we are studying the effects of shock waves and hypersonic flow on ice crystals specifically. So there has been some work done on droplets, but as it happens, what's in the upper atmosphere is mostly not liquid water, even though that's what like, people like to study on the la- in the lab because it makes these beautiful splash patterns. It's mostly ice. So determining how a shock wave affects ice is potentially more relevant for hypersonic flight in a practical sense than the effect of droplets. So we are trying to explore and kind of just started year two of a three-year project to explore that uh, first in our um, small shock tunnel that uh, I didn't mention, shock tube really, uh, at ASL, and then uh, ultimately potentially at some DOD facilities or the Southwest Research Institute. Well, let's congratulate Joe once again. Congratulations, Joe.